Lauren, thank you so much for joining us. You are the Urban Wildlife Coordinator for Nevada Department of Wildlife. What is considered urban wildlife here in Clark County? Uh, in Clark County, urban wildlife is essentially any wildlife interactions that occur within city limits or residential areas. So it's areas where there is a congestion of people that are living there and that are learning to live with wildlife. And this is an example, we're in the Dunes Discovery Park here at Sunset, probably one of the hidden gems where, you know, there's no soccer fields or frisbee golf or anything like that. But this is a prime area and you've got houses and areas around here. So this would be an area, right, where your services could be required, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. And we do respond to calls uh, located right here in Sunset Park because there is sort of an, an abundance of wildlife to be had here. And, you know, there's humans that are enjoying that wildlife too. So, okay, we think of the typical coyote, snakes, uh, lizards, things like that. What, what else? What other species, what other animals are we talking about? Uh, in addition to coyotes and lizards and snakes, there's rabbits, especially here in Sunset Park. You'll see a lot of those. Uh, birds are definitely a common inquiry in this area. It depends on the season, too. So in springtime, we're definitely going to get a lot more of those bird calls while they're nesting and breeding. Whereas in the summer months, it might be more of those reptile calls, like those snakes and lizards that are starting to come out. You talk about um, nuisance waterfall. What's considered nuisance waterfall? And, and is that, you know, like on your swimming pool? Gosh, one of our fellows here was saying he had a duck on his swimming pool. And is that considered nuisance wildlife? And what should a person do? I, nuisance wildlife is essentially any wildlife that is disturbing or interfering with, you know, something that you're trying to accomplish in your area. So nuisance waterfowl can definitely be a problem in the Las Vegas area, especially when it comes to pools, residential pools that might be surrounded by golf courses. And the reason that waterfowl can become a nuisance is because they might be pooping in your pools, which clogs up the filters. Uh, they can create, you know, a, a sort of messes in the area too, or refuse to leave. And that does become a problem for a lot of people that do want to enjoy their pools, especially during this time of year when we could use the refreshment. What should a person do if you all of a sudden see a bird t taking a fancy to your, to your hot tub or your pool? Uh, it's important to act fast when it comes to these sorts of things. So waterfowl, just like a lot of other wildlife, it, can be easily habituated to an area. So if they find a habitat to be desirable and there's nothing stopping them from living there, they will continue to come back. Uh, so we encourage what's called hazing, and you can do this with a variety of wildlife. It's essentially making them feel unwelcome. So it's being bigger and scarier than them. So you can make loud noises or shoo them. And just shoo them? Shoo them, yeah. And just encourage them to find more desirable habitat. Uh, and when it comes to waterfowl, it's really important to look out for nesting activity. So if you notice a duck or a goose beginning to build a nest on your property or near your poolside, you wanna immediately remove it because as soon as they lay just one egg in that nest, it is federally protected. And so then you're dealing with a, a more long-term problem as you wait that process out. Quite often, that's where people kind of jump in. You guys have an excellent public service announcement that uh, shows and gives some information on fledglings. And if you find uh, a nest in your yard or accidentally that uh, the fledgling or an egg comes out of the nest, talk to me about how big of a problem that is and what people should do. Yeah, absolutely. So especially during the springtime and even right now during the summer as birds are starting to leave the nest, we get a lot of inquiries regarding baby birds and you know it's in our nature we as animal lovers we want to protect the wildlife we want to save the wildlife and that's really wonderful uh, but there are some situations where interfering might cause more harm than good so if you see a bird that's left the nest and it's hopping around on the ground and it has some flight feathers so those feathers that allow it to fly even if it's not flying yet at this point it is probably a fledgling uh, and that is essentially a phase that birds go through. It can last usually for most bird species around a week or two where they kind of just clumsily walk around or hop around on the ground and learn to be a bird. And you know, it's the teenager cycle of birds. And during that time, the parents of the bird 
are providing food and protection and you may not always see it. it. It can happen every few hours or sometimes just once a day in some bird species. But it is absolutely important to kind of just back off and keep your space, give space to the bird so that parent isn't discouraged from providing that care. Because again, I think most people's nurturing sensibility is they want to put it in a towel and take it in the garage or take it inside somewhere. And that's yeah. probably one of the worst things you could do or? It is, uh, yeah. It's especially during that phase where it is so vital for those birds to have a specific diet that's provided from their parents. I mean, just like any wildlife species, human species, you know, we have very specific requirements for survival and it's typically only individuals of that same species that can really attune to that and provide that sort of care. So we definitely don't want to intervene. A lot of times these birds might look injured because they are clumsy looking and their feathers are tattered because they're still growing in some of those final flight feathers. But oftentimes it is just a fledgling that's just kind of going through a, a normal phase of life. Let's shift gear to something like snakes. Obviously they are here and I think most of us, you know, you see a snake and you go the other way. I mean, that's pretty logical, I think. But what if, what if you see a snake like on your property or something? What should you do? It, it depends on the circumstances. Um, generally, snakes are not going to reside anywhere, just like those other wildlife species, reside anywhere that's not desirable for them. So if you do notice any snake activity in your yard, I'd definitely recommend removing any debris or brush piles that they might want to hide in. Keep your pets indoors for the meantime and you know try to keep your space from the snake because it's not likely that it's going to want to stick around somewhere where it does see that human activity so use caution and if it does become a persistent threat then that's something that we can react to in in some ways but typically when it comes to snakes they are going to move on to more desirable habitat and you know with rattlesnakes especially they're one of the only animals that gives you that warning before they strike uh, which I think we should all be thankful for and take seriously. So if you do notice that activity, follow your instincts and just stay away from it. And I think we've all seen coyotes. At, gosh, there's one right there now. No, I'm just there kidding. <laughs> but anyway, and I, I think I, I saw something that you wrote that they really aren't too much of a threat to humans. Uh, it's important to note that coyotes don't often attack humans. In fact, you're more, like, more likely to be killed by a stray golf ball than get bitten by a coyote. I mean, that's true, but what about like your little pets? You seem to see the occasional things that happen here in, in the valley where, you know, a small dog or a cat will in, have a, a, a bad encounter with a coyote. Yeah, absolutely. So small dogs and cats, those are typical sizes for the prey animals of coyotes who typically hunt after rabbits or rodents. So you want to make sure, especially in areas where you know that there's coyote activity, always keep your dogs on a leash and closely supervise them outside. If you have outdoor cats, I would definitely recommend bringing them inside if you're noticing coyote activity because a lot of the fatalities that we do see with small dogs and cats is from those dogs or cats being loose in those areas. Much of your job is public outreach. A lot of the information what I found today was actually on the on the nextdoor.com. Uh, and is that something that you encourage people to um, put their information out there if they can't contact you? Yeah, absolutely. So. You know, in these last few months where we've been limiting our in-person interactions in the community, we've really taken advantage of some of those virtual outlets like the Nextdoor website. So personally, I use the Nextdoor website to reach out, especially with coyotes, to reach out to target neighborhoods that I've been getting phone calls from or inquiries from regarding coyote activity. Because when it comes to, you know, hazing animals like coyotes, it requires an entire community effort. And we're realizing from our side that sites, social media sites like the Next Door website are a perfect outlet to reach people in the community that otherwise we might not be able to reach. And it really does help provide that initiative to kind of get everyone banded together. And you do have a lot of good information with how you map where there are coyote sightings and different bird sightings. Do you find that they're in the same areas all the time or what what would be a typical area that wildlife might show up it depends I mean with birds that is sort of scattered all over the map you know we have nesting activity in a variety of areas throughout the valley and you know sometimes they just choose the strangest places to build a nest 
So I wouldn't say that that has uh, necessarily a pattern, but when it comes to coyotes, we absolutely see trends for coyotes using the system of irrigation and canals that we have winding through the city as their own personal highway. So if you live near an area that runs along a creek or a canal in the Clark County area, then you might be seeing some of that coyote activity. We definitely have uh, concentrations, you know, right here in Sunset Park where there's an abundance of wildlife for them to survive off of or in the wetlands park and really any green oasis areas, uh, golf courses as well, provide that perfect habitat for them. So if, if we think of an area that we would like to live as a wild animal, a place that has food, water, access to shelter and habitat, that is the same kind of area that a coyote or other animal might want to find as desirable habitat too. And finally, I know you do uh, public outreach. Obviously, again, we're in a little different times during our pandemic times, so but you'll go out to schools or different organizations to give information about wildlife. Tell me how uh, people can contact you to uh, learn more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that can be done through phone number or email, which I can provide. And um, so I'm, I'm definitely very responsive in those regards. And with schools, we love to go out to the classroom and provide not only urban wildlife education, but just general education about all of the awesome wildlife that we have out here. And when it comes to problems in communities regarding nuisance wildlife, like maybe those waterfowl or coyotes, if it's a, a problem of persistence and doesn't seem to be coming to a resolution, I am more than willing to come out and speak with the HOA communities or the neighborhood as itself to see if we can come up with some solutions. Great information. Thank you so much for joining us, Lauren. We really yeah, appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you.